I'd like to start off with what this video will and won't be. It won't be a video that tells you exactly what to look for and how to scout every single type of terrain because there's simply too much information. It would cover a volume of DVDs and I don't necessarily consider myself the go-to expert on the subject. I usually default to people with a lot more experience than I have when I'm trying to learn new terrain. This will be a video that tells you exactly how to scout, what resources to use before, during, and after your scouting trip, how to plan your scouting trip out so that you can cover ground efficiently, spending all of your time in high percentage areas while walking past all the stuff that won't teach you anything. I'm going to tell you the best way that I know to take notes, utilizing the technology that we have available to us, so that when you go back this fall to hunt the spot that you scouted this spring, you can remind yourself exactly how to access it, what wind to hunt the spot on, how many climbing sticks to bring, what direction to hang your tree stand, and other miscellaneous notes. While I'm filming this video, I'm going to be simultaneously scouting an area that's pretty new to me, so it's going to be a great way to really show you how the process works. This video is going to focus on postseason scouting, which for us northerners basically turns into spring scouting. It's April 12th here in Minnesota and the snow just melted a couple days ago. We still got ice in some of the lakes. This is the very best time of the year to scout. It might vary a little bit depending on where you're at in the country and what the weather's like, but this is always the time of year where the snow has just melted. So all the deer sign from last season is preserved, but yet the woods haven't greened up yet. So you can see a long ways and it gives you a good representation of what the woods are gonna look like once the rut comes around and once that gun season comes around, once that late season comes around. I realize that some of you guys might not be watching this video until maybe well into the summer and kind of miss the boat on this prime time. If that's the case, I'm making another video that is dedicated to going in blind, which is basically a strategy that you use 100% online scouting for, and you never actually step foot on the land until the day that you hunt. It's a strategy that's been very successful for me over the past couple of years and I have some good examples that I'm going to use to help explain how that strategy works and how I use it. The best place to start your scouting trip is online. I'm going to start off by showing you guys a weather website. I can use this website to find out what the prevailing winds are for an area. So I'll just take say this Lake Alamo point here. Open up the report I'll go down to wind statistics. Now I can go and choose September or October, November. And I know that in say September, for example, the wind's basically either going to be north, northwest, or it's going to be south, southeast, or it's going to be changing in between one of those two directions. And I can use that to my advantage when I'm looking at a map. So that takes me to caltopo.com. This is probably the best all around aerial and topo website that I've found. I can take a spot like this. I can look at it in a normal topo view. I can click on the shader relief. I can do an aerial topo hybrid. Or I can do a contoured satellite, which is great. It's just not quite as detailed as the normal topo and then a slope angle shading, which is kind of nice when you're in really hilly terrain, because I know, for example, if I get something that's got some purple in it, it's pretty much a sheer cliff. And I know that if I have something that's red, from experience, if the ground is frozen, I can't climb it with normal boots. There's just not enough traction. Remember that prevailing wind map that I was looking at? It said, South, southeast, and north, northwest were the two most common wind directions during hunting season. And I'm going to want to focus on areas on the leeward side of hills. So that means I'm going to look at the hillsides that are facing south, southeast, and hillsides that are facing north, northwest. For bedding, I'm going to look at points. So if I just go down, I can mark point, 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 again, again. I can circle all these points on this map and then I can highlight every single hillside that's on a lee side of a hill. The third thing I'm going to look at is any kind of terrain funnel. And in hilly country like this, a lot of times if you get a really steep ravine or cut, that's going to funnel the deer because a lot of times you get blowdowns in those cuts and the deer are going to cross around over the top of them. So if I look right here in this bowl or that one, or even if I look right up through here, there's a cut right here, there's another one right here, another one right here. I can check all of those spots for potential rut funnels. And then if I go back to my aerial map, now I'm going to look for other funnels, but more specifically I'm going to look for transition lines. 
So if I look right down here, I can see that there is a transition line. This must be a pine plantation. So I'm gonna walk that entire edge. And you can see pretty much anywhere where there's a field, you have a transition line. And now you can't really tell on this map too terribly much, but whenever the forest transitions from one type of tree to another, that's gonna be another great transition line to check out. The government actually has some pretty helpful mapping applications as well. If you go to a county specific site, you're probably gonna find some type of GIS mapping application. Um, so to find this one, I just typed in St. Croix County GIS and it gave me a link to this mapping site. And this is nice because on this county in particular, I can go from totally a street view to totally an aerial view or anywhere in between. And I can click on a particular parcel of land and it'll give me the owner information. So since this is part of the Willow River State Park, it's owned by the state of Wisconsin. But if I were to click on one of these private properties, it would give me the landowner's name and how many acres that particular parcel is. So it's kind of nice if you're looking at an area where somebody owns say 640 acres because you can click on all of those different boxes and find out that they're all from the same owner. I'm not exactly sure I'd open with that information if I was trying to get permission on a piece of property. It might come across as a little bit creepy if you tell a guy that you know his name and just about everything about his property from online searching. Some states like Wisconsin also have mapping applications that tell you other types of public land. So this map tells you all the managed forest land in Wisconsin, where it's located. This is basically private land that you can have permission to access. All the people on this particular program are getting tax breaks on portions of their land to be in this program. And the only caveat for that is that now that land becomes open to the public. And until they had mapping applications like this, it was almost impossible to find out which properties actually had this public access. Minnesota has a link on their Department of Natural Resources website that allows you to download a Google Earth link. And it gives you WMA information for all their WMAs across the state. All those yellow outlines. Now, I can't leave off with probably one of the coolest mapping applications online, which is Bing.com's bird's eye view. If I click on bird's eye on Bing.com slash maps, I can zoom into an area and just get incredibly detailed photos. A lot of these pictures are taken at different times of the year. And different angles have different photos. If I just hit this 90 degree rotate. So when I'm looking at a map like this, then right away, different transition lines become extremely obvious. Being able to decipher these individual trees like this allows you to pick a tree that you want to hang a stand in before you even ever step foot on the land, which is something I've actually done a number of times. Here's the gear that I will usually bring on a scouting trip. This is gear that I pretty much consider essential. Um, I've got, first off, water. It's pretty deceiving how much water you can actually burn through. I like to bring a minimum of a half a gallon, knowing that there's a small creek right around here. Today I brought just a filter and an extra bag to save on weight. I also got a snack. You can see I took the healthy route today. I'm only planning on being out here for a couple of hours, but if I was gonna do an all day trip, I'd probably wanna pack more food, something with a little bit more protein, a little bit more fat to give you more sustained energy throughout the day. I also have a video camera and GPS with extra batteries. These two are pretty much essential to my method of scouting because when I find a point of interest, I'll mark the spot on the GPS, say waypoint 150. Then I'll take the video camera, turn it on, start recording and say, Waypoint 150, and I'll start taking a bunch of video of everything that I feel is important, where the trails are, what tree I want to climb, how many sticks I'm going to need to use to get up that tree. Then when I get home, I can collect all that information, organize it on my computer, so that it's all right at my fingertips when I want to access it. On a very first scouting trip like this, this might be all I'll bring. When I go out a second time, 
a lot of times I'll bring a tree stand, I'll bring climbing sticks, and if legal in your area, pruning shears or a saw. That's when you go back, further analyze the information that you gathered on your first scouting trip, and you actually climb those trees that you thought would be good, and you clear them out, you make sure, okay, I got lanes here, I got lanes here, I got lanes here, and then you're ready to go. Just make sure you visualize what those trees look like once they have leaves on them in the fall. Now, when I do find a spot, there's a couple of analysis questions I want to ask myself. What season do I see myself hunting this? What time of day would I see myself hunting this? How would I access this to avoid spooking deer depending on what time of day I'm hunting? What type of sign do I see? And if I do see sign, is a sign that's more likely to be made at night or during the day? Because that can all make a big difference. This is waypoint 198 facing toward the river. This is not far at all from waypoint 197 that I just marked. It's kind of in that same little thicket along the top side of this bluff. Again, no deer is going to go beneath you because it's pretty much a sheer cliff, 80 foot to 100 foot drop. So the deer are going to stay up on top of this ridge when they're moving. And there's probably not too much more of a definitive terrain funnel than this cut in the terrain right here. Every deer that comes through here and wants to follow this trail along the edge is going to come through this brush and back there away is this private land. So any deer that is going to come out of there is going to come somewhere through this brush. They're going to stay up on top of this lip right here. And anywhere in this general vicinity they're going to move through. I think the most likely spot they're going to move through is down right along there. There's another scrape somewhere in that direction. And pretty much any one of these trees that you can get high enough in you know, getting way up into that tree right there. Probably need at least, you know, four sticks to, for sure to be above that branch where you'd probably need to be to help get your scent over those deer beneath you. Or maybe in that tree right there. Lean back a little bit, nice for an all day sit. Possibly even in this tree with that red marker on it facing out toward the woods. Then that wind would carry right you sent right over the top of you out across the river. You won't have to worry about getting winded. You have pretty good shooting at any deer up in this area with a bow. Again, I like this better as a bow spot than a rifle spot because any deer that comes through here, you probably see further along the trail to the north and you got more open shooting up there. So I'd say rifle up there, we went 195, 196, bow down here. 198, 197. All right, so the spot that I'm in right now is worth mentioning because this is a pretty good example of a staging area close to bedding. Now, behind the camera, there's one of those open grass fields again. They regularly burn it in the spring. And then over to my right here, extremely thick. You pretty much couldn't even walk through it. On the back side of all this, there's a point. It drops down into a ravine on that side. And on that side, it drops down into a big river. So what I envisioned the deer doing in this type of situation, and especially because this whole area has leaves roughed up everywhere from animals, squirrels, deer, whatever. I envision these deer coming from this extremely thick, kind of secluded spot underneath the top of that hill. Those deer are going to filter out from their beds in that thicket and they're going to forage around in this area right here. So this would be potentially a spot where I could maybe access it from the river by boat, or I could maybe even access it if I had the right wind from that hill and drop right down into here, set up a stand and I'd be ready for all those deer coming out of the beds. How do I know, besides just the fact that this is thick, the deer are gonna wanna bed here? One of the reasons is I see 
dropping piles just about everywhere. When you see piles of droppings in large frequencies, it usually means the deer are spending a lot of time there. If they're spending a lot of time there, it either means that it's a food source or it's a bedding source. And this is definitely looking more like bedding to me. Now, how I can take advantage of a spot like this is during gun season. This is about as far away as I can get from the parking lot. And during gun season, guys are gonna be pushing deer around. You can either hunt them two ways usually. You can either hunt the exit trails they take to get back to their beds where they feel safe, or you can actually hunt in the bedding area. This cluster of trees right here presents me a great opportunity to set up right in this bedding area and wait for these deer to come filtering back in when they get pushed around. So I would come into a spot like this, maybe on opening day, maybe the second day of gun season, well before light, I'd set up in this tree and just wait pretty much all day. This would be an all day type of scenario. This is a good place to talk about rubs and other sign. This little four wheeler trail that I'm on right now is chock full of old rubs, new rubs. All these trees on both sides of this trail are about the right size that you would see a lot of rubs on. And for a newer hunter, this would be a very tempting spot to try and hang a stand around because there's so much sign right through this little corridor. But one thing I notice about this spot is that it's very close to this wide open field. And one of the things I'm going to ask myself when I see sign, whether it's a scrape or a rub, is how comfortable is that deer going to be making that sign? Would they be comfortable making that sign during daylight? Or is it a spot where it's more likely that the deer made that sign at night? And given the vicinity to this field, I'm going to say that it's more likely that all these rubs are made at night for the most part. You know, during the rut anything could happen. But I'm going to follow this trail back a little bit further toward the thicker cover where I think there's going to be more bedding. And when I see sign there, that's the sign I know that has a higher probability of being made during daylight, and that's where I'm gonna hang my stand. So the first thing I do when I get home <clears throat> is I'll plug my GPS into the computer and I will upload my track and all my waypoints that I collected. And the next thing I'll do is I'll take these little pins and I'll just put them over the waypoints and rename them. So I just basically replace what's on the GPS. And really the only reason I'm doing this is because Google Earth is kind of touchy, I guess, as far as time. If this little slider up here, this date slider, if it gets messed up, sometimes your GPS tracks, the current tracks disappear and you gotta readjust the date. <clears throat> if I wanna have everything always visible, this is a, a good way to ensure that. The next thing I can do is I can drop path. I'll just call this path one for now. I can go up to my places, add a new folder. I'll just call this spot one for now. And then I can take these pins that I just made and put them all into spot one as well as the path. So now even when that GPS information isn't there all I have to do is look at spot one and I can turn on and off all that information. Once I have all this information into Google Earth it really allows you to actually take a look at the bigger picture and really understand that overall deer movement. I'll just drag and drop all of those video files for the waypoints and I'll rename them so they match up with the actual waypoint and I can use that in conjunction with Google Maps. So if I want to look at waypoint 195, I can just jump into that folder and check out video 195. And also you notice here how I basically just have one line on this track. I didn't go walking around all these woods. That's because 
before I went in there, just like I showed you in that map before, I just picked out all the high probability areas and I just walked those. I really don't care a whole lot what's going on in here. All I'm worried about are these spots down here. I can tell you that I liked what I found and I'm looking forward to hunting here in the fall. And now if some of you guys are thinking, okay, that's nice. I know how to organize myself when I go scouting, but I'd really kind of like to know a little bit more about why I'm making the decisions I'm making, why I'm choosing to just go to these certain areas, why in that map before I could know right away to highlight certain sections and circle certain sections. I want to know more about that. Well, while you can look at books and articles online, I find that the best resources tend to be online forums, just because they're always question and answer based and you can get live feedback. While I have been members on you know Archery Talk, Bowsight, all the big ones for several years, the forum that I personally like the best for hunting information is thehuntingbeast.com. If you guys go over there, my username is bowhunter15. It's a smaller forum when you compare it to something like Archery Talk or Bowsight, but I find that the information is a lot more dense and it's run by guys that are do-it-yourselfers. Uh, a lot of the guys hunt public land and have taken several nice bucks and they have a couple really, really, really good instructional DVDs. So if you guys hunt in marshes or hill country like this right here, it's a really good place to get started and ask questions. So I definitely recommend you guys check that out. I've got links to pretty much every site that I've talked about so far down in the description. And if you guys liked this video or thought it was helpful, please like it, leave a comment down below, and share it with your friends that you think it might help as well.